peace and peace and peace to you, my friends. I uh, stand with you today with a heavy heart, um, with a broken heart. And yet I ask and I insist that we still speak about love. We were never promised happiness in this world as a daily companion. The only promise that we've been given by the loving Lord of all is that the God of the mountaintop is also the God of the valley bottom, that the God of the bright sunny day is also the God of the stormy day, and that the Lord will never leave us alone and abandoned. So yes, today my heart bleeds because those 49 beautiful souls who were shot down and murdered by a terrorist in their house of worship, they had come to adore God, and they were killed. And we have seen this. We have seen this in a Sikh gurdwar. We have seen this in a Pittsburgh synagogue. We have seen this in the black church in Charleston. And we are seeing this in the mosque in Christ Church. Christ Church Mosque. Our suffering is connected together. Our wounds are connected together. Our humanity mingles with one another. We can no more deny the humanity and the presence of divinity in any one of us then we could deny God. So I might not be making my usual customary jokes today, and I think you will bear with me, but I do want us to hold on even in our tearful days like today. Where's the place for love? when the world seems so broken? How do we heal and love one another when bluster and division and hate-mongering seems to find such a ready platform, including from the highest offices in the land? Every time that some of us would like to say, I can't believe that this kind of atrocity would happen here. This is not the kind of place where such violence takes place. We have to take a deep breath and say, if some of us are having to bury our children, then yes, this is the kind of place where this happens. And if we want to be a kind of community that has no room for something like this, then we have to build that world. We cannot just inherit that world from our ancestors. We have to build it together for our children. And all of us, the Christian, the Muslim, the Jew, the Hindu, the Buddhist, and the atheist, have a role in this. I'm grateful 
to you. I'm grateful to Scott. I'm grateful to Heidi. I'm grateful to the whole staff of your church for inviting me, inviting your Jewish rabbi, opening your hearts. And I keep asking you to continue to open your hearts. Even where our hearts are breaking, this is precisely the time for us to hang on to one another. The wonderful Jewish rabbi who continues to inspire me, Abraham Joshua Heschel, has this powerful writing that he told his daughter. He says, Hitler didn't come to power with tanks and guns. It all began with uttering evil words, with defamation, with language and propaganda. Words create worlds. Words create worlds. Beautiful words, beautiful words about love, create a beautiful and loving world. Likewise, hateful, divisive, and angry words create an ugly word. What I ask us to do for all of us, of all faith backgrounds and communities, is when you hear someone speaking those angry words about a whole block of God's children, stand up, hold your head up high, and firmly and lovingly and gently say, you do not speak for us that the God that I adore loves all of his children. We cannot do this alone. I cannot do this alone. Scott cannot do this alone. We need each other. And we're in this together. If we go up, we're going to go up together. And if we come down, we're going to go down together but we're wrapped up in one another. Our survival and our salvation is deeply connected with one another. But I also want to talk to you about love, and I insist that even in the darkest nights of the soul and in the valley bottom, and maybe especially in those times, We've got to talk about love. We've got to live love. Love not as some mushy, fluffy emotion. Not as this thing of, I love you today, I may not love you tomorrow. But love truly as who God is. To see love, to welcome love as the unleashing of God onto this realm, to see love as what's brought us here, as what nourishes us here, and what is going to take us back home. Some time ago, I had a chance to go to Northern California with my wife. I got married again six months ago. Sometimes you do get to live again after you've been dead for 20 years or so. And we went to Moyer Woods, which for me is one of the holiest spots in the whole of the country. Tall, majestic redwood trees. The tallest organisms that the good Lord has ever created on this earth. And I'm looking up at these trees that are two, three hundred feet tall. And a guide there said to us, 
Did you know that these trees have roots that are only six feet deep? I thought, how can this be? How can these tall, majestic, some of them a thousand years old and more, trees that rise up to these majestic heights of 200 feet, 300 feet, have roots that are so shallow? How come a good stiff wind and the storm, because in life there are going to be storms, don't knock down these trees? And she said, well, these trees have a little secret. They lock the roots together. The roots don't just go down, they reach out and they grab on to each other roots. Every one of them is drawing on their own nourishment and sustaining, but they're holding on to one another. And if a good wind comes and one of them begins to wobble a little bit, the other ones say, I got you. You're not going to fall alone. And if you're going to fall, we're all going to fall. And for a thousand years, some of these trees have stood like this. Their roots hugging one another, grabbing onto one another. That's a sign of God right there for us, my friends. Today, it's my community being gunned down. Another time, it might be another community, and I do pray that it is never your community. Let's hang on to one another. There are those who would want us to live alone and isolated and fear one another. We have nothing to fear from the children of God. You have been made by God's own hands and the breath of Allah, that same name that Jesus called on in his sweet Aramaic and Syriac, the God, the one. The breath of the one flows through you as it flows through me, through your babies and through my babies. And I do not fear a child of God the artistry of God and the breath of God. Let us hang on to one another. Let us love and protect one another. Let us live as the saint who gave his life in your beautiful city, Dr. King, told you. Let us live a dangerous kind of unselfishness, a dangerous kind of unselfishness. Let us live what the African saints tell us, Ubuntu. Ubuntu, our humanity is wrapped up together. You don't have your humanity and I don't have my humanity. Humanity is something we share and the extent to which we are truly human fully human is the extent to which to each we reach out, grab on, and hang on to one another. One of these wonderful mystic poets from our tradition, Rumi, puts it so beautifully. He says in this simple little poem, I cannot be who I want to be until you become everything that you ought to be. I cannot be who I want to be until you become everything you ought to be. It's not a zero-sum game. If we have an infinite God of love, love is not finite. You and I, my friends, are born out of this infinite love. 
it's not going to run out. By me loving your babies, it doesn't leave less for my babies. So he's got this wonderful poem called You and I. I'd like to read that for you. I came back to it this morning through some of my tears. He says, Faithful friend, come, come closer. Let go of you and I. Come, come quickly. You and I have to live as if you and I never heard of a you and an I. You and I have to live as if you and I never heard of a you and an I. And thank God that we have thousands and thousands of years of teaching about this tradition of love. It's there in the Jewish tradition. It's there in the beautiful Christian tradition. And it's there in the luminous teachings of Islam. There's a wonderful female saint in the Muslim tradition called Rabia, humble little woman, short and petite, but a heart that was bigger than the whole world. She's walking by one day of a sacred house of worship. We're not told if it was a church or a mosque. And there's a preacher, a male preacher, who was sitting up on the pulpit repeating something that some of us might have heard once or twice. The male preacher was saying in a loud voice, Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. And Robbie just minding her own business, and she stops, and she pokes her head in through the door. And this male preacher is a little annoyed, and he repeats a second time, Knock. And Robbie comes in and says, What did you say? And the preacher says a third time, I said, knock, and the door of God will be opened unto you. And Rabia says, my friend, the door has never been closed. The door that you're knocking at, you're knocking from the inside. you're already on the inside of God's presence. There is no place outside of the divine. If you ever have a chance to read scripture, not just a list of such and such begat, such and such begat, such and such begat, which is like the surest way to drive people out of church. Yes, you can, if you want to know how big King Solomon's bedroom was and the bathroom dimensions, you can read that probably twice in the Old Testament. Or we could read it with the eyes of love. Every chapter of the Quran begins with this phrase, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of the one whose compassion and love enfolds you like the womb
And that word is repeated twice, Rahman and Rahim, sometimes translated as compassionate and merciful. But if you know to look for it through the eyes of love, you'd recognize that these words, compassionate and merciful, come from the root of Rahim, which is the womb of your mama. God's love and mercy wraps around you, enfolds you, contains you, protects you, nourishes you in the same way that a mama carries her unborn child. Muhammad says, you and I, my friend, it's as if we are inside God's womb. The whole universe, every living soul, every sentient being, is as if we are inside the womb of God. It doesn't say, you know, those of us who are first Baptist, we're inside God's womb, but those second Baptists and those third Baptists and those seventeenth Baptists for sure. Uh -uh. The whole universe is inside God's womb. Every child of God, every sentient being. So often in our prayers, we look up, oh God, have mercy. My baby girl, and on days like today, you want to hug your kids just a little more closely. If you've got your folks, your parents, your community, your babies, your friend, your neighbor, your stranger, the refugee, hug each other just a little more tight these days and let them know that they're loved. My daughter, who's now 11 years old, when she was three, I would put her to bed every night, kiss her a few hundred times, and we would say our night prayers. I would always do this. My love, I want you to ask God to keep you, to bless you, to fill your heart with light. And this three-year-old child, as God is my witness, took my hand and pointed it inside her. And she said, Baba, Papa, Daddy, Baba, God is not up there. He's in here. That three-year-old child came into this world knowing that she is a child of God. There's not a thing that I, as a professor of religion, can teach her that she wasn't already born with. You and I are already inside God's womb. Let us, my friends, let go of this idea that God is somehow beyond, outside, or ours. God is not mine. God is not yours. None of us get to put a trademark after God. We are God's, apostrophe S. We are inside God's womb. We are contained inside God. And we've got to love on one another. We've got to serve one another. And we've got to protect 
one another. Let me end, my friends, by teaching you something that the wisdom of the Islamic tradition teaches us, and how moved was I to hear the late and great Vincent Harding, a close friend of Dr. King's, teach me the same thing in the years that I had a chance to sit at his feet. Uncle Vincent used to say, and my Muslim teachers have said the same thing, love is not a feeling, it's not a sentiment, it's the very being of God. This love is flowing through you, through us. And we got to merge with this love. We got to become this love. We got to walk this path of love, even at the valley bottom, just as we do to get to the mountaintop. Uncle Vincent used to say, when love comes out into public, we call it justice. Justice is a fancy word, but it's not ultimately about distribution of money and resources. Justice, real justice, is a work of love. I love my babies more than life itself. I would give my life for any one of them. And I know you love your babies. Justice simply means we should never allow something to happen to other people's babies that we wouldn't want to have happen to our babies. We want the same thing for each other's babies. When love comes out, we call it justice. And when love goes in, we call it tenderness. Tenderness. And tenderness is a quality that is in short supply in this country that you and I call home right now. We're all trying to be tough. We think we've got to be fierce and radical. We can be radical in confronting injustice, but that same love means we've got to be tender with one another. As I leave you and I ask for God's blessing on you, on us, May this love spread around the whole of humanity. May God be with the brokenhearted. May God bring the comfort to those for whom there are no words. And may God that divine mother, that divine father, make of us a loving people whose love shows up as justice and moves inward as tenderness. May you be blessed. May you be blessed. May you be blessed. You're in the season of Lent. Some days, every day, might feel like a Good Friday. There is a resurrection coming. May this spirit of God be resurrected in all of our hearts and make of this old, broken world a new world. Amen.